Hi. Um, I'll start in the most humble way I can with, um, with a picture of myself. Uh, my name is Ted Person. I'm a design partner at uh, Ikita Ventures. And I've spent the last 20 years um, designing uh, marketing campaigns and designing products in the form of startups and also in the form of uh, running various uh, agencies. And the topic of the next uh, 15 or so minutes is, uh, is about human beings and about how irrational human beings actually are and how we can navigate that in product design and in marketing. But before that, some shameless self-promotion. Uh, self um, I work for Ikita Ventures, which is a fairly new uh, VC fund. Um, and Ikita Ventures is a part of EQT, which is one of the Northern Europe's largest private equity companies. And Ikita Ventures has only been out there for, for a year or so. And we're a multi-stage fund. So we invest between very early stages, 1 million euros, and later stages, 75 million euros. And one thing that sets us apart from the, from the um, other um, in the landscape is that we're, uh, we're mainly ex-entrepreneurs and ex-operators. -ex and we've so far done uh, a bunch of investments, I think 20, 22 in total, uh, some here in Finland and throughout, uh, throughout Europe. With that being said, back to the actual main track of the, um, of the presentation. And I figured I would start in the end of um, annoyance, because there are certain things that you don't really understand how they can work. So for instance, if you're, if you're a designer, you might have been annoyed with Amazon. How, how can Amazon work? Because it doesn't look very, very nice. Maybe the last few years, it has looked, started to look a bit, bit nicer. But it, back in the day, it used to look really, really crappy. How, how, how can it be like this? Or to, to take an example that is closer to Ikita Ventures, because we have the, the founders of Booking.com in, in, in our team. How can Booking.com be that successful as it is? Because it's just like a lot of boxes and kind of feels hard to navigate and, and so forth. Um, if you are a, uh, a developer, you might be annoyed with, uh, with IBM Watson. It's just a couple of different, uh, different disparate tools I hear over and over again. How, how can that work? And if you're a human being, how can this guy be, uh, be the president of, of, of the United States? How, how, did that, how did that happen? And I think the answer to all these three questions is because we're not fact-based as human beings. We're, we're very emotional beings, and we have a lot of cognitive biases going on in, inside our heads. So if you apply this on the three examples I just gave, I think Booking.com is one of the most carefully crafted user experiences. And they use a lot of emotional engineering and nudging to make us do what they want us to do. In terms of IBM Watson, I think this is an example of world-class uh, storytelling, creating this story about this uh, character called, uh, called Watson. And this guy is, um, I think, the, the opposite of being fact-based. But he's a really good storyteller. He understands the, the, the power of visual uh, persuasion and also language patterns and, uh, and so forth. So I figured I would, I would share three learnings that I have gained uh, the last 10 or so years uh, with you, starting with, um, in a way, what I just talked about, that stories have this tendency to beat, uh, to beat facts. And I think this is because we're storytelling animals. Even though we have very small like, data, uh, we try to fit that small data into a story, because that's how we work. We're sequential, and we want, to, we want to hear stories, and we're good at telling stories. And I even read this, um, this research report, this is a bit old now, uh, around that the uh, evolution of language actually comes from um, these small, gossipy, stories, almost like a live rating system in between human beings. Should I hang out with that person? Should I hang out with that person? What's this person's role in the, in the group? And, uh, and so forth. So I think when, when we as builders, engineers, designers, when we build stuff, we usually start in a very functional end. What do we want to build? What's the product we want to, to bring to the market? And, and uh, we usually start in the, in the end of benefits. And I know if any of you remember Microsoft Zune. I think this is a Zune ad uh, uh, telling about all the cool features you got uh, just when Zune became the Windows Phone platform. And if you contrast this with, with this, which is maybe five years prior to, uh, to Zune, I think it's very clear. There's a, there's a story. Um, you got 1,000 songs in your, in your pocket. And this is still very, very functional. If you 
take this story to an emotional uh, level, I think this is a story of belonging. And I don't know if you remember this, but in the beginning when you, when you had the, uh, the iPod and then later the iPhone, just wearing those white iBuds, earbuds uh, was almost like being part of a, a club or something like that. On the subway, people like nodded, ah, we, we, we have the same, the same thing. So that's, I think, a, a good example of, of uh, connecting on an emotional level rather than on a functional level. Um, if you haven't seen uh, uh, Simon Sinek's TED Talk, Start With Why, Google it and watch it. It's also a bit old, but I think it's really good. And it, it talks about the story and, and, the, and the power of, uh, of purpose and that uh, people today connect with a, a product or connect with a company on emotional grounds and to connect with the, the purpose, why you, do, why you do something. And if you're a startup, and I, I think a good exercise to do is to sit down fairly early on and think about what is our why and what is the story that comes from, from this why, almost like a narrative. At Equity Ventures, we call this a mother story. So uh, when we got started three years ago, we sat down and crafted our own mother story, and now we've updated it a few times. I think this is really, really interesting to follow over time and see where were we in the beginning, where are we going next, and so forth. And we won't have time to go through this mother story in detail, but you have here, what's the problem? Um, we, our belief that entrepreneurship is a, is a team sport. Uh, we're an entrepreneur-driven VC. We have, we're supported by the EQT platform. We have some proof points in there. And then it ends with a, with a call to action. So I, uh, when we work with our startups in our portfolio, uh, we, we support them in developing their own mother stories. And this is good not just for, for product or for marketing, but also for, uh, for culture. And when crafting this mother story, I think it's easy to become overly complicated. I, I like this quote from, from Elon Musk uh, in, an, in an email when he really wanted to get rid of all these weird acronyms at SpaceX that people used to, uh, to um, exclude people from the, from the group. So keep it simple. Another example here, I think, is, is how Apple used to communicate. And I think this is one of the classics when Steve Jobs killed Flash. Uh, just the simplicity in the, in the wording. My, my mother and my dad would, uh, would understand this. So that's number one, uh, stories beat, uh, beat facts. Moving on to uh, something also vaguely uh, Apple-related um, on standing out and thinking differently. And I think this is also kind of interesting. The, the word branding comes from branding cattle in the, in, in the early days. So the whole idea here was about standing out. And especially in categories where products are pretty much the same, it's very important to to say, tell people how, about how you're different. So here we have Volvo, Audi, and uh, BMW, and, and just look how differently they, they communicate with <laughs> Swedish House Mafia and, and, uh, and the data and, uh, and uh, horsepowers and stuff like that. But in, in startups, I, I tend to see uh, um, another tendency. So if you, if you have a, a category and you're disrupting that category for real, and then the logical thing would be to stand out in how you present your product or how you design your product. But because it's new, a lot of these companies want to belong to the category. And it's also because companies in the beginning are engineeringly driven, and you might not have designers and stuff like that on the, um, on the team. So um, thank you. And another, uh, another interesting aspect here is that uh, a, few, a few years back, uh, if an engineer created a website, you could see that. They looked kind of crappily. Nowadays, with uh, frameworks like Bootstrap, it's very easy to create something that looks kind of decent. So when I look at startup websites, I think all startup websites look exactly the same. And it's, there are trends in this as well. So uh, 2015, all startup websites looked like Intercom's website. Those were the, the, the big trendsetters. And now it's all about uh, Stripe with the, like 45 degree angles and, and so forth. So I guess the, the messaging here is uh, think about this and, 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 and do try to, to make it distinct. Try to find your own voice based on your why and your, and your story. I think this is an interesting example. This is uh, Adidas' Impossible is Nothing campaign. And, and uh, they made this distinct by adding something that sounds kind of weird. I mean, Impossible is Nothing is not even gra gra grammatically correct it would be nothing is impossible. But just because it's, there's some weirdness in it, you remember it more. And it's the same case with Think Different, which should be Think Differently, 
uh, of course. So make it distinct, maybe add some kind of weirdness to what you're doing. I think that's a good, uh, it's a good piece of advice. Another tip is to make it fun or uh, to, uh, to make it a bit weird. Um, this is uh, Dr. John Medina, and he claims that emotionally charged events persist much longer in our memories and are recalled with greater accuracy than other memories. And I think that's also in this picture why he chose to have his brain outside your, his, his head, because you, you remember this picture more, and thus you might remember Dr. John, John Medina. So in a way, you could claim that if you take the old Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, from the base uh, needs to self-actualization, and apply that on, on products, it's almost like this. You have the functional, it has to be reliable, usable. But then on top, make it pleasurable, make it fun, make it, uh, make it quirky. Uh, and it's lacking. And I think this is a good example when you close apps in, uh, in iOS. It's almost like, uh, like bubble wrap. It's the same almost addictive effect. And look for these addictive effects and, and try it on, uh, on people. Uh, and just ma to make you remember, remember my name, I figured I would do an experiment. So this is a TED Talks stage, obviously. Some guy talking about, I don't know, big tattoos or, or something like that. But then if I, if I add this TED doll, uh, to the TED uh, stage, and then I add this picture of myself, most likely you will have uh, higher accuracy in recalling my name after this. So my name is, uh, is Ted, my name is Ted, and my name is uh, Ted. So that was number two, about thinking differently, making it visual, uh, funny, quirky, um, standing out. And the third one here is about exploiting the cognitive biases we all we all had. And we, we looked at this map before, and there are so many. And, but I think it's extremely interesting just to like, spend some time with, uh, with looking at them. And I even ordered a, a, um, a painting or like a, yeah, to, to put on the wall with all these different, different biases. And, and here we have some of the ones we have been talking about that bizarre, funny, visually striking, or, or stuff like that is, is easier to recall, or that we tend to find stories and patterns even if there are no stories or, or patterns. Um, but there are some that uh, connect more to or relate more to uh, visual perception. So uh, for instance, there are the, uh, the principles, of, principles of Gestalt, um, which are um, five design laws in a way. And it's about how we as human beings perceive, for instance, things that are grouped together. So things that are grouped together, we think make up a unit. Or things that look the same make up a unit or uh, how our eyes move. So you can put things in between, and then they, they become a, a story almost, like one, two, three. Closure, how you use negative space, and also figure and ground. And I think just thinking about this and how you can use these um, visual biases in, in, your, in your design is kind of interesting. So for instance here, one of my favorite logo types, where they added this, this closure effect. I don't know if you see, it, see the arrow there, but after you've seen this arrow, you, you can't stop remembering it and looking at it over and over again. Um, some more biases that I think are interesting uh, from a startup perspective. There is this baby face bias uh, that has evolved over, over the years, where we tend to, to like cute things, things more. And I think this, this is used in startups over and over again. So this is, of course, MailChimp and their, their character. Um, this is pretty smart, I think. This is not. Twitter's uh, icon or mascot, but actually if something goes wrong, they, they use this cute thing to maybe prime you into a, a nicer, nicer place. And anyone know who this is? This is GitHub's Octocat, the same thing, very cute, and you, you connect with the cat and like it a bit, uh, a bit more. So that's, uh, yeah, you have the golden section for aesthetics, this is Twitter. Um, you have the David versus Goliath bias, where human beings always tend to back and like the, the smaller of the, uh, of, the, of the two, which is very good for startups, obviously. Expert or consultant bias, where we tend to listen more to people who, who look, look as if they are knowledgeable, like the, the doctor's coat. Also things we can, we can use in, uh, in design in, in different ways. So another, another tip, go, go to Wikipedia, search for cognitive biases, and, uh, and just go through them, and then have a reflection about how you can use them to, to hack people to do what you would like to, um, to achieve. So those were my three tips. This is the third one, exploit the cognitive biases. Um, here you have the three of them. Um, stories beat facts, 
think differently, exploit, exploit the cognitive biases. And before uh, handing over for questions, just three book tips. And, and some of the examples here are taken from these books. The first book here is called Designing for Emotion, which is a part of the Book Apart series, which I think is really, really good. Uh, buy it, read it. It's only like 60 pages. Um, another book, which is a newer book, is a book created by Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert. And he was bashed like a few years back because he, he, he backed um, Donald Trump. And he also foresaw Donald Trump beca becoming the president a few years back. And this book is, is about Donald Trump's tricks, in a way, uh, in, in persuasion, which is a really good book. And then this is one of my favorites. Um, uh, Cialdini, who is like the master of persuasion, his, uh, his book, 50 Scientifically Proven Ways to Be, uh, to be Persuasive. And uh, personally, I think these books that are not particularly about design, marketing, I think they have more sort of value in, in this than your typical design book. So uh, that's it. My name is uh, Ted. Any, any questions? Uh, yeah, applause. That's good. Good. And yeah, okay. and just pick a, a one or two questions from the Slido in front okay, of you. Okay, sure. Thank you. So here's one question. Um, design thinking becomes a bit outdated as a concept for some reason. What is the next uh, big thing? Uh, obviously, I don't know who asked that question. Um, um, I'm not sure that design thinking is a bit outdated. I think maybe it's connected to Apple's hype that they became the, the most um, highest value company in the world. And if the big hype now is AI, I don't know. But I think there, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in, in the generative design space, where you, where you use computers to assist you in the, in the design, um, design process. But to me, I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that design thinking is, um, is, um, is outdated. Uh, here's another question. How can we apply more design principles to, uh, to venture funding? Um, one, one thing that I, that I do as a, as a VC is that I, I usually try to start with the end. So what is this company trying to, to do? And then I work my way, work my way backwards. Um, I think just having a, a big think about simplicity and who are you targeting and stuff like that makes a, makes a huge difference. And sometimes we have big debates in the team because sometimes technically progressive um, works against being easy to use, for instance. So I think there is this, this contrast there, uh, potentially. And here is the third question. Um, you mentioned start with why. Do you, think, do you think that with so many startups nowadays, it's better to start with what? Um, I think that's the opposite of the whole point of this presentation in a way. I think there are so many what's out there, so many companies doing similar things. So I think it's uh, about finding ways to connect in other ways than just around exactly what you're, you're offering and or what you're, what you're doing. That was the third question. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, all right. That, thank you, thank Ted. You. Thank Let's you. give a hand to Ted person. Thank you. I think everyone will remember your name now. Ted. Ted, yeah. The only one.